right. Well, then I'd like to call this meeting of the Whitley Slide Board to order at looks like 6.01 p.m. First order of business is to uh, review and presumably vote to approve the meeting minutes from December 27th. Does anyone have any comments on the meeting minutes? None. None. Okay. Minutes. I will second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, there. unanimously there. Uh, the vendor and payroll warrant, are there any comments on those? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and we're going to let in the, oh, in the nick of time, aren't they? Um, okay, great. Let me get to, so now uh, we're on item three, public comment. So now it's the time to listen to comments from the public related to items not listed on the agenda. Um, so I think you have something for the public comment period. Well, I'm here to talk about the digital equity municipal plan. Oh, program. that's on the agenda. So the, we'll, you'll have time to, to speak to that. If I have Anything for you, Pete, other than business that's on our plate already? That's, um, okay. Yeah, I just I gotta go look for the chapter 90 reports. Okay. Um, and now looking into the uh, audience here, I see Becky, Fran, Adelia, Corinne, and Rhett and Natalie. Do any of you have anything you want to say in the public comment period? I'm not seeing any hands raised or anything like that. So I take it the, the public joining us by Zoom does not have anything specifically to give in public comment. Okay, well, we're just in time then for scheduled appointments. Uh, it's a couple minutes early, actually. We have Representative Blay here to discuss the legislative priorities for the upcoming legislative session. Do you want to say something to start out, Natalie, or, or how do you want to run this part? No, I, I appreciate the invitation uh, to, to be here with you tonight. Uh, this is something that my office does every year. Uh, we try to meet uh, with every select board in the 18 communities of the first Franklin district, which could be a scheduling nightmare. Uh, and I just want to recognize Corinne Coriat from my office, uh, my legislative aide, who does an extraordinary job with that. Corinne, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Corinne. I've been with the rep for about two years, so I think I've met most of select board at the at this point but happy to be here with you tonight so we schedule these meetings just uh to allow the space for us to talk about what waitley's priorities are uh, we've just started the 193rd session uh, so we we were just sworn in last week and uh waitley is the third town that we've we've met with so far since uh, since the beginning of the year so I'm grateful for the time and just want to provide you with the opportunity to, to let us know what's on your minds so that we can make sure that uh, we're fighting for the right things on Beacon Hill. Okay. Well, um, maybe I'll go through the board members first since um, uh, we may have some things, then I open it up to anybody here who would like to give some input to, um, to our okay, members. Well, my list is kind of long, and I figure it overlaps with other people. <laughs> oh, I, I did well. But well, why don't you start? Because then, <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. And then chime in the if you have. And, yeah. and and these are not in any particular order, um, but uh, uh, something that we it's a perennial problem. But housing, um, a low income or even affordable housing is a big problem statewide and it's not not a problem here. Um, I'm a I'm the select board's representative to the South County Senior Center Board of Oversight. We had a meeting just a few days ago. Um, and uh, one of the things our director told us was that she had seniors, I mean she can't give names or towns or anything, uh, at least one senior who could not be placed in a shelter over the holidays because the shelter in Greenfield and the shelter in Amherst were full. Um, we, we just, we need more affordable housing for, you know, for people who are, who are from here and uh, still want to live here where they grew up. Um, and I, 
I know there are various programs, but they're, they're not working that great. There's, I don't have necessarily an idea as to how to make housing work other than you got to build it. And if we wait for the private sector to do it, it's not going to be built until every mansion is already built. Every mansion that's highly profitable will be built first before we get um, just affordable housing for um, for people on fixed income. So that's that's one thing that I, I, I hear out in the community. Um, and I suspect we've, we've discussed it at our meetings as well. It came up at our uh, resilience meeting uh, where we're, we're looking at a project to get a resiliency plan for climate change because climate change is going to be, you'll be okay if you have a lot of resources, but if you don't have a lot of resources, you're going to be way not okay uh, coming out in, in climate uh, well, with, with the climate change. So the housing was one of the things that we're going to focus on on that plan. Um, and, and these are really not in any particular order. That one is, is kind of particularly grim and perhaps an unwieldy problem and it's difficult to, to, to figure out. Um, but there is something that we, we have done. Um, we are currently uh, living in a world where anybody from a committee can join a meeting by uh, Zoom, as many of you are. Um, soon that law will expire. And uh, if you're the chair of the committee, you have to be there in person, even if nobody else is. And I think it also requires that a quorum of board members be there in person. So um, I, I think Waitley has a policy that all meetings will have, uh, will allow people to join by Zoom. Mm -hmm. So for our participation by people, then I think that's, that's going to be very good to, to keep. Um, but the state overrides us when they say that the chair has to be there in person and that a quorum has to be there in person. Uh, and uh, I, I just think we should bring the open meeting law into the 21st century. Um, as we've kind of shown over the last few few years, we can do it. We can do it. I mean, we have the technology, I guess, to, to quote the uh, the movie. Um, if I can just yeah, so um, the open meeting law. It's just, open meeting laws are very tough on committees or groups like this with three people. Mm -hmm. That is, it's a straight jacket rather than anything else. You know, not being able to talk to another member of the board about essentially anything is, I, I don't think the open meeting law contemplates three person committees. Okay. Yeah. You have anything to add? No, nope, you're doing nope. great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> right behind you. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it wouldn't be a meeting with with my state rep if we didn't at least bring up tax expenditures, which <laughs> sounds great. It sounds like you're spending taxpayer money, but what you're actually doing is giving that money to some organization as a tax break. And the budget of tax expenditures, the amount we give up every year in taxes that we do not collect, is equal to the state budget roughly in any given year. Uh, those tax expenditures do not get reviewed every year. Our budget gets reviewed every year. We're about to go into budget season. And every single line of our budget is going to get looked at by our finance committee, famous for their generosity, right? Um, this is, and and, and they, they, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be good stewards of the public money. But tax expenditures are not. Nobody looks at the tax break to... Uh, I'll pick on Raytheon for a moment. Nobody looks at that to see if they actually kept or those jobs in Massachusetts. Um, nobody looks at these and, and and actually holds people's feet to the fire to do what they promised or said that would happen when you gave them the tax break. Mm -hmm. And there's I know there's incredible resistance. There's a lot of like political inertia there. But um, our budget, our school budget, our town budget, every single line in our budget, gets looked at every year and we scrimp and we can't always give people the raises we think they deserve or even cost of living increases that we think they deserve. But the tax expenditures never get looked at. And I think that's a structural problem that's not probably gonna be solved in one session, but I have to bring it up every time we have. <laughs> you have you I appreciate to that. I, I appreciate you wanting to be a uh, a good steward of taxpayer dollars. I think that's important. Okay. Um, any? Okay. 
Um, and next thing I have on the list, it says marijuana permits. We're wondering how Northampton got 12 of them and Waitley is still waiting for, for just one. Um, we've got uh, three or four places that are you know, trying to get through the process. Um, and some of them have been flagged probably for good reasons by the commission for one thing or another, not really being in order. Um, but we've got people who've been waiting years. We have host community agreements that have expired and had to be extended twice. Um, they, they, we don't understand why Northampton is the only place that's allowed to have uh, the benefits of uh, uh, marijuana retail. Um, we could really, we, we could, it's to, to me, it's sort of another example of the state doesn't think we need to raise our own money and they're not going to let us raise money <laughs> with this one legal way that we can do it. Um, and I, I, I don't understand. I don't, I guess we didn't bribe the right people. I don't know. Um, that's, I, I, I just don't get why they're dragging their feet on anything that could go for sale in our towns here. Um, in the South County. So that's that's something that's on my mind. Um, the, well, it, Fred Orlowski is not here, but I feel like I should bring up the utility pole problem that it's really, it falls between the cracks of the three major users of the poles, the uh, Comcast, the Verizon, and uh, the uh, electric company Eversource. Um, they need to put up a new pole. They're really happy to do that. Nobody's willing to move their lines over to the new pole and get rid of the old pole. And we've got you know years worth of these all over town. Um, every, we've had like all three parties at a meeting together, and they all swore they were going to get together and do something about it. And how many do we have now? Last count. Jeez, it was upwards of 50, about yeah. 58 last time. Wow. Yeah. There's like these, are, these are double poles? Yeah. These double poles sitting there with um, that are not complete. And so someone came in wanting to uh, permission to put up another pole, and we said, not until you take down some of those double poles. We have not heard from them. Maybe they figured out that they don't really need a new pole, but it's it's really, it that's ridiculous. It, it might not be as high a priority as housing, I mean, housing, utility poles, and I guess it depends on your perspective, which of those is more important. Um, but um, but that that's something I thought I should mention because it's come up so many times in our meetings. Can I just kind of add something on that? Sure, add something, please. So what the problem is, um, is that there's a law in the books that says that um, utilities can be, can essentially be fined, I think it's $300 a day for, for double pulls after so many days, I forget what it is, and I can send you the specifics. Ninety. Um, Ninety days, right? <laughs> so there's a law in the books that says that that they can be fine. And then there's this court case that's that's that exists. So there's there there's case law that says that only the Department of Public Utilities can find the utilities when polls go beyond that. So we essentially have legislation and case law that are actually creating a barrier to municipalities. Um, having any enforcement authority, so it's it, it's a case where it's a case where we need legislative action to to solve that gridlock. Because without that, the utilities, the Department of Public Utilities, is never going to do it, and the utilities aren't going to do it. So until there's legislative action that that solves that, removes that barrier, it's it's going to we're going to have the status quo, and we're going to have fifty eight polls because nobody really cares. So, yeah. except for the people who live here, right. except they for the people who live in front of them, right? So yeah. we care, but we can't do anything about it. Literally, can't do anything about it. Yeah. I'll step off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is the soapbox meeting. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, any more before we go? Um, the next item on here is also one that comes up uh, every year. Um, is that we need to find better funding streams for special education, school transportation, and starter school funding. Um, that those are such big items in our budget. I know there's been improvements in those in the past years, um, and we've got to keep pushing on those um, to keep improving those. So I, uh, so I both appreciate the progress that's been made in the last couple of budgets, but I. Um, I, I want to let you, that's still on our minds. It's 
usually oh, two thirds roughly of our town budget for our schools, um, including transportation. And when we uh, lose money to charter schools, it comes out of the regular budget. It doesn't cost us less to run the schools because one child goes somewhere else, but it, uh, it, we, we lose you know $10,000 or more funding when that happens. And the, I don't, I'm not against having charter schools. I think students having choices and parents having choices is a good idea, but we need a different stream of funding rather than robbing our, our local schools um, of the state funding that they would otherwise get. And so I think that's a problem we've discussed before. I just wanted to make sure it's still front of mind. Um, anything else you want to add on schools? Here, here. Here, here. Okay. Um, the last two items um, have to do with um, electrification of our transportation. And I know there's more and more uh, funds available for that coming out. And I think that's, that's really good. Um, on the federal level, most of the incentives are still being doled out as tax credits, which we don't really uh, uh, qualify for. So when we want to get an electric police cruiser or an electric truck for the, we don't get the 7,500 tax credit because we're not, uh, we don't, we're, we're a municipality. So um, I, what I, I got sketched down here, it says help with electric vehicle purchase for municipal use uh, and charging infrastructure. I know there's a lot of that going on, but we have to keep it up. And, and especially to promote, um, electric vehicle purchases for municipalities, having the kinds of vehicles that we want in, um, I'm going to I'm going to call it the wrong thing, but there's a, a town, or there's a state purchasing, um, oh, what is it like when, when Jim was talking about police cruisers, there was a state purchasing agency that he goes through or uh, I might have the wrong name for that. State Bids. The State Bids Operational State. Services Division has. Oh, the Operational Services Division has a has a place where you can go for vehicles that are already approved for uh, for state for purchases within the state. Because I know we have a, a pretty strict and and good. I'm not saying it's bad that we have strict purchasing laws for municipalities. Um, but if there were more electric vehicles of the kinds we're looking for, like frontline police cruisers. Um, uh, I know they don't necessarily have heavy duty construction vehicles yet, but the light duty ones, um, there are more pickup trucks coming out. Um, then we use those, uh, things that can be used for plowing, um, et cetera. Things that don't have to go many, many miles, um, but things that are still really necessary and use a lot of um, our, our municipal fleet money. Um, so I don't know what we can do to promote getting more municipal vehicles that we want to purchase in there, but whatever we can do along there, um, and then helping helping with charging. I know there's grants that are sometimes available. There's we've tried to uh, take advantage of some of the grants, and some of the grants have peculiar restrictions on them that made it so we it, we couldn't really use them. Um, I'm trying to think of one uh, where. Oh, I don't remember enough about it, but they were there are some peculiar ones out there where we we really would have to pay for the charging station. Um, and they would, I don't know, pay for the ribbon or the bow that goes on top or something, uh, something equivalent. Um, and um, and on that same note, there's an opportunity. I don't know if people are talking about it in a circle jury. Um, and that is uh, electric buses that could have dual or triple use. Um, we would love to be able to have electric buses to send our kids to school in. Um, that would be awesome to get replace those diesels. Um, but they only get used twice a day, right? Um, why not have a kind of bus that could do school transportation and local public transit, where we could be able to maybe take people to and from uh, points on the PVTA or just schedule your regular trips that you can call and sign up for uh, some kind of public transit role for those buses when they're not being used for school buses. Um, the other thing, an electric bus would have a pretty big battery and you can have those attached to the grid and it can act as battery storage as well. 
So in the summer, especially when they're not being used for public school buses, um, they can be available for peak use. Um, you can tap that energy during peak use periods, which I think is more of a problem in the summer than in the winter, but there's no reason why you couldn't use it summer or winter. Now, I know school buses have different rules than public transit buses, but there must be an intersection there somewhere um, between what school buses could be used for and what public transit buses. Um, that you, you should be able to, we should be able to come up with an electric vehicle that could do that. Um, and right now, the uh, school buses are in private hands, and public transit is sort of in public agency hands. PVTA is public ish. Um, so I, I don't really know what the solution is there, but there's a, uh, there's a lot of efficiencies that we could take advantage of. Um, and maybe different places to pull money from to be able to purchase those kind of vehicles and then set some rules for how they could be used um, more efficiently in the community to solve problems that we have kind of on both ends of the age spectrum. Um, one of the things, and since I'm part of the BOO, I get updates on this, but uh, they got a, a van, which is not an electric van. It's a, it's a regular um, fuel vehicle. Um, but that van has been a real godsend to some people um, because uh, they have trouble getting to and from doctor's appointments. And if you're wheelchair bound, even the folks at Valley Neighbors, I think that Kia and Fran know this, we don't have a lot of volunteers who have a, a wheelchair accessible van that they can transport people in. But the senior center does. So they're able to uh, take that out and help people get to doctor's appointments. And they've set up a system for people to ask for rides you know, especially wheelchair bound folks. Um, so, the, I mean, we we know it all can be done. I don't know how to solve the the problem of of like school buses and public transportation being so separate. I've lived in countries where they're not separate. In you know, in Japan, school kids took the public transit because public transit was so good. Um, and of course, we don't have that same thing here. We don't have enough public transit for it to be good enough for students to get to school for the most part. There are exceptions to that. I know school choice students from Greenfield often uh, come to Frontier on the bus because uh, there's just enough buses and the timing is just about right for them to get to school and then be able to take a bus home. But that's the only one I know of where around here where someone can actually take a public, uh, public transportation bus to school. Um, so I guess that's something I'd be really interested in seeing if we can pursue and if other towns, you, you know, in your district are interested in that kind of thing. Um, then, you know, sign us up for the pilot program, is what I would say. <laughs> um, that's the end of my list of things that I can remember. So um, <laughs> do you want, do you want a, a minute to chat or do you want me to open this up to- um, I, wish I can follow up on one thing we yeah. talked about with the electric vehicle. Yeah, a few months back, we were looking at electric vehicles for the police department, and we asked the chief to look into it. And after several weeks, he got back to us and told us that frontline vehicles were not available, they just didn't exist yet. Is there some way to get the state to be an information bank or data bank or whatever? For Because the technology is changing so quickly, and the availability of vehicles for police, for fire, for highway you know, heavy equipment, whatever, is changing so quickly that if we could get, if the state could just email blast quarterly or monthly or you know devote some resources to getting the information out to the communities. We're not the only community looking to electrify our vehicles, yet every police chief, fire chief, highway person has to go out and do their own homework on this. And I think it would be much easier if the state could sort of keep the a technology update for the municipalities and get that information out so we don't have to keep you know, every municipality to reinvent the wheel. Sure. Okay, I see Becky smiling there. Is that, I just want to make sure I, I let you all. Is that out? Is that a really anything too well? Um, as the newest member of the board, I'm mildly intimidated. You're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't bad at all. Don't worry. She, she covered everything. Wonderful. 
I'm sure I've forgotten things. That's the thing. I'm going to go home tonight. I'm going to go. I've got something well, else. You, you've got my number, so. <laughs> We'll probably be, go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask something that um, we've worked on here, and I'm only asking it out of kind of ignorance and being an this person on the board. Um, we've got this gorgeous old school building in town that we are looking for a developer to do something wonderful with. And I'm sure that this is an issue all over New England, that there are older buildings that... Um, yeah, are in bad shape, but could be repurposed, and it's cheaper typically to repurpose something than to knock it down and build new. We've gone out uh, looking for folks to give us proposals, and so far have not had luck. I'd love to know if there's anything on the state level that we should be taking advantage of. No, I, I appreciate that question, and it's certainly something that that we come across often in our office. We were, you know, and, and it runs the gamut. It's from wanting to repurpose buildings to wanting to demolish buildings. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was just in Montague last night, and we were talking about about the Strathmore there. Um, you know, I'd be happy to to meet with the town, and I think I saw Jessica Atwood there too, um, and with Franklin Regional Council of Governments to talk about what the what the town is hoping to do with that building, uh, to see whether or not there are state programs available that could be of assistance to you. Um, each project is just so different. It it's really I, it would really require us you know, sitting down and trying to to figure out exactly what it is that you're trying to do with that building. Um, and then, you know, if there are state grant funds available, we've had tremendous success bringing Boston to Western Massachusetts to see um, what we to see on the ground, what we see every single day and mm -hmm. helping them to understand the very unique challenges uh, that we face when it comes to these projects, because they are so expensive and our towns just don't have the capacity to be able to take these on. So, you know, once we take a look at it, if there are state programs available, we would hopefully issue an invitation to have folks come out, you know, do a tour with us uh, in, in hopes of securing funds uh, as we have for projects like the Bridge of Flowers um, and, and other projects in the region. So um, I welcome the opportunity to, to talk more about that specific project and what you're thinking to see if there are funding streams out there that we could help with. Okay, at this point, what we've been looking for is a uh, long-term lesser that yeah. we're looking for, um, who would take on the cost of renovating the building. Um, but if there are other opportunities, I'd be interested in hearing about them. Okay. Yeah, we should, Brian, if we could schedule a time to, to circle back around on that, that would be great. Okay. If, if I can, and I'll ask Keith to follow up, Keith Bartle to follow up on this visit. I mean, his department, we've got two multi million dollar projects that are staring us in the face here. We've been, we need a new highway garage, and we've got a bridge which is one lane. And somehow is not rated poor enough to merit quick replacement. Mm -hmm. um, both of these would be huge burdens on a small town to undertake, yet both are really necessary. If there's anything that we can do to get you know, some sort of consideration on these things and work with the state to get some form of funding to help us afford them, because Again, multi-million dollar projects are not something that we can undertake very easily yet. And we, we need a highway garage the same way Boston needs highway garages. Um, yeah. And they've got more avenues, you know, the bigger cities and towns have. Yeah. Can they more tax, we have a tax them? base. Yeah. We have a tax base to be able to do these projects. And um, Senator Comerford and I did introduce a bill last session relative to uh, establishing an, an MSBA type of authority for municipal buildings and public safety complexes. Uh, we plan on introducing a version of that bill this session. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also spoken with Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Uh, she actually brought up salt sheds <laughs> and, and the need for, for the state to um, 
you know, to, to look at programs that can help communities to fund programs like that. Um, you know, DPWs uh, do some of the most important work in our towns and, you know, there's, there's not, they don't have um, organizations standing up behind them to support their efforts. And so that is something that, that we've flagged as an issue with the incoming Healy Driscoll administration is that they need to be looking at some sort of municipal building authority uh, that would fund municipal buildings, public safety complexes, and our DPW infrastructure. Um, on the roads and bridges side, that is also something that we've flagged, as you've probably heard, we are falling far, far behind when it comes to the condition of our roadways and bridges. Um, we've developed a, a, list, a list of recommendations for the Healy Driscoll administration to take a look at. Uh, those did include you know, increased funding for roads, bridges, and culverts, recognizing that culverts are also a big, big um, cost item for communities. Uh, but a lot of this has been, you know, talking with them about, and they get it, they've been out here, they understand that there's just limited capacity when it comes to funding projects like these, and it can really, really break a town. Um, one of the other pieces that, that I've been working on is uh, we've all, we keep asking for increased chapter 90 funding, uh, but one of the incredible programs that we were able to fund this last session was for another, was for $100 million for the Winter Roads Assistance Program. That was a home run for rural communities because while chapter 90 focuses on a lot of factors that don't really help rural communities, the Winter Roads Assistance Program is by mileage, by roadway mileage. And that was tremendously impactful for rural communities here in Western Massachusetts. So we're trying to ensure that that is somehow continued moving forward and that it's not a one-off because we did see the impacts there. Um, I'll also be reintroducing the bill on unpaved roads uh, in an attempt to continue to lift up the fact that some of our communities do have 60% of their total roadway mileage uh, as unpaved roads. And that also creates an undue burden on our communities as you're trying to spend your chapter 90 funding as best you can uh, with as little as we get. Uh, and, and this could be a real game changer for communities as you're trying to maintain those, those unpaved maintain or improve those unpaved roads uh, because we are seeing in some communities that roadways are just shutting down completely. And that's a public safety mm -hmm. issue. It's an economic development issue um, and yeah. you know, it, it's everything. So, uh, and I do wanna just recognize the town's incredible advocacy around Haydenville Road. Um, you know, that project is hopefully moving along and uh, Brian's been doing some great work as, as has a DPW. Um, in terms of really advocating for, for that funding and that project to move forward as quickly as possible. I'm happy to run down the rest of the list if you wanna, if you wanna give me a couple more minutes, if that's helpful, otherwise we can just- Let me, let me pause real quick to see who else wants to uh, okay. add up. And if Becky said she has to leave in a, in a minute or two, is there okay. anything you want to add, Becky, before you go? Oh no, I Joyce, I loved everything you said. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, I did too. <laughs> oh, I yeah. see Brian's got a finger up, and I know Brian has something he wants to say. How about other folks in the audience here? Okay. Um, then uh, let me do uh, Brian first, then we'll go to Fran, and then we'll go to, uh, to um, Keith. And then anybody else, speak up if you want to chat after it's too. So I just want to touch briefly on, on, on two things in there, their cannabis and um, um, police reform. Um, in, in terms of cannabis, um, I'll, 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 I'll hold my rant on the, on the recent amendments to the cannabis legislation that I think is not in favor of municipalities, but I won't go into much more detail. Um, there's a concern in, um, uh, the police chief and I were having a discussion with, with, uh, a third party about, uh, social consumption. Um, and I just wanted to convey what he had said and, and he expressed concern, um, in terms of the expansion of social consumption. Um, because the technology in terms of determining whether somebody is intoxicated or not doesn't exist right now. So um, he was just identifying a real, a real challenge that would exist. 
I know those pilot programs are going to start rolling out, I believe, in whatever communities um, are part of that initial program. Um, but there's concern that the technology to, to, to identify who's intoxicated and who isn't doesn't exist um, in that poses really but significant safety you know, concerns uh, for the roadway. Sure. Um, so again, we don't have a solution, but I just wanted to identify that, that that's a that's a serious concern because we're talking about really people's lives and, and health and safety. Um, and the second one is related to police reform, um, and I, I don't have too many uh, I don't have too many of the details because I know it's still being worked through. But um, we we learned of a figure that uh, of what was it two hundred ninety thousand. <laughs> But regardless of what it was, there, there's concern that our some of our existing equipment would be considered non-compliant, and we'd have to replace it at yeah. a cost of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the ones yeah. that, the things that were identified were were body cams, were body cams, um, and uh, tasers, so non-lethal, you know, non-lethal force. Um, so there was concerns that. It, it might cost us, I think it was upwards of yeah, $200,000, um, you know, just to replace those. Things. It, we, those I feel things like that, we only just got those. It, and we yeah. did, a, it, the town was very proactive in, in, in implementing body cameras as, you know, a lot of these issues were happening over the past, I would say, five years yeah. in, in trying to stay on top of really, really both of those things, tasers and, and body cameras. And now it, it, it appears that there might be regulations that get passed that make those non-compliant we would have to replace those. And allegedly, I don't know if this is true or not, but there may only be one vendor who, um, I mean, that's essentially yeah. what we were told, well, that there's a that single vendor, vendor would, that. I'm sure that vendor would not raise their prices due to high demand. I'm absolutely sure. sure would they would be public spirited <laughs> yeah. and they would not raise their prices due to, to high demand. So if that's if that is true, that's that's a significant burden for us. If there was funding to help with that changeover, that would be great. And if there wasn't, if there was usually there's some sort of sunset period or something that mm -hmm. that would allow us to get you know our investment back in in, in purchasing that equipment over a period of years. Um, it seems like if it was I don't know if it was good yesterday it would mm -hmm not necessarily be good not necessarily be bad right away um yeah. so those are those are two concerns that, that oh, i appreciate you flagging that one i have not heard that from from anyone so i appreciate you flagging it and if if you were the chief could just follow up with me mm -hmm. on any additional information that you have there that would be really helpful for me to then uh track that down thank you yeah absolutely <laughs> and yeah just your help with the hayden road project to keep that yeah. Moving along, uh, we very much appreciate it. And thanks for all that you've done. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I think I said Fran and then um, and then uh, Keith. Fran, go ahead. Thanks. Um, uh, briefly, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what um, um, Joyce said. Uh, I think housing, affordable housing is definitely needed here and some way of financing and making that a little bit more doable by small towns is important. A second uh, concern I had is um, with the transportation. Obviously, Whaley has very little public transportation and very difficult to access. And I would like to see how the new monies from the fair share amendment that are earmarked for transportation get split up so that actually a fair share comes to Western Massachusetts. And um, particularly in getting the two regional transit agencies to work together, whether um, uh, it can be done, I don't know, but so that there's some public transportation access in through Deerfield, which there, there used to be, uh, the extension of the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority bus used to go to a parking lot there, but no longer does. And that kind of a connection just a little bit further would go a long way i think in getting some people uh, out of their cars and providing some easier access to shopping for for elderly people for example with no vehicle access and i know this 
from uh, the work that Valley Neighbors has been doing. We, we do a lot of rides and they are for people who, have, who live miles from the uh, nearest bus line. So um, just wanted to mention that. No, I appreciate that, Bryn. Certainly one of the bills that I introduced last session and will be introducing again is the Regional Transit Authority um, Advancement Act, which mm -hmm. which does fund, it provides a, a floor of $150 million, which is a significant increase. Um, and it also calls for the implementation of recommendations that were included in a, night, a 2018 report about mm -hmm. our regional transit authorities and um, programs, policies, and funding that they need in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, certainly micro transit and you know, things that would be very helpful in our rural communities is top of mind and um, is also something that we flagged with, with the Healy Driscoll administration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and you're done, Fran? Yes, thanks. Okay. Uh, Keith, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, Natalie, how are you? Oh, I didn't know you were in there, Keith. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the tiny, tiny yeah, his mother's house. <laughs> <laughs> I can only see so many people, and I didn't know you were there. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. So one of the questions I have for you is, um, I'm assuming you, or I'll ask, have you had a chance to meet our new transportation secretary, Gina? Yeah. So I haven't, but I have had, I have heard good things about her and okay. we'll be inviting her out here um, to learn more about rural communities. Um, I heard good things about her from Jonathan Gulliver, who, as you know, was incredibly helpful to us with Haydenville Road. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful there. Okay, well, what I was leading into is, you know, if, if there is ever an opportunity, especially if she does come out to Western Mass, I would definitely like to have a chance to chat with her, give her, you know, my perspective of how we here in Western Mass deal with the small town type of stuff versus her background. I know she was with the city of Boston and has extensive knowledge there, but, you know, comparing us to our small towns, I'd like that opportunity if I could. Um, yeah, I think it would be good to have her out here. And I do just want to say, I know we had an email exchange with a, a Waitley resident, but, you know, the District 2 Highway Administrator out here has been really great to work with, too. Incredibly responsive, as, as has Jonathan Gulliver. I'm hopeful that Jonathan will stay on as the Highway Administrator for Massachusetts, uh, because he has been incredibly responsive to any concern that, that we've raised for him. And the other thing that I wanted to point out as has already been discussed earlier, you know, Waitley, you were looking at needing to replace the highway department, put a new highway garage in. And one of the things that seems to always um, be an issue is our procurement laws. Our procurement laws get set, we have thresholds, Inflation comes through, prices go up. Five years later, what you could do, you can't, you no longer can do without having to, to jump through more hurdles. Um, as you know, Conway recently did their hiring department. They were able to, to get by and get under some of those thresholds. And yet the numbers from them that are three or four years ago, are the exact same numbers that we would have to encounter right now, but yet nothing has happened as far as having inflation adjust those thresholds. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that something done along that line. Okay. In particular, the OPM threshold, which is still one and a half million dollars. Correct. I mean, one and a half million dollars when that was first set was a significant amount. Now. We couldn't much do a project. You can't somewhere. do much with one point five million dollars. You know? Yes. Yeah. I'm here. I hear you, and I'm happy to look into that to see what if if, if anyone's talking about it. Okay. Very good, Adelia. You've been very quiet. Is there anything you'd like to add? Hi, Adelia. It's good to see you. <laughs> okay. So that sounds like Adelia just wanted to say hi. Um. All right, and we look around one more time. Has anyone thought of anything else they'd like to add? 
Okay, then and then I, I'll turn it over to Natalie and let you have, have anything else you'd like to add. I know you've been kind of interspersing your 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 comments in, but it sounds like you've got at least one volunteer for the transportation tour of Western Mass. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. No, I know. I've got Keith's number. I know where to find him. Um, no, I, I appreciate you flagging all of these things. It, it's good to hear because I've been working on a lot of, of, of these pieces over the last four years and certainly plan to continue them. Um, and that, with a new senator. Um, and yeah. so we're excited about that. I, I was with Senator Mark in Waitley on election day. So uh, I know he's anxious to get started. We would love to meet him here. Yeah, tell him to call me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Um, you know, top of the list for me this upcoming session, uh, and it's going to take all of us working together to get this across the finish line, uh, is implementing the recommendations from the Rural Schools Report. Uh, I was co-chair of the Rural Schools Commission with then Senator Adam Hines. We put out a report in July and are now in the process of pulling together an omnibus piece of legislation to implement as many of the recommendations in that report as we can. Um, the top, you know, top item there that we're trying to get past is that $60 million floor for rural school aid, which would make a tremendous difference for schools uh, in our rural communities. Um, and then once we have the, the bill in place, I'll make sure to share that with all of the communities who are in Western Massachusetts so that you, know, you can advocate for that piece of legislation and for that funding because uh, it's going to take all of us across the entire Commonwealth and every rural school district to get that major piece of legislation across the finish line. Uh, again, it, you know, I've been working closely with the Healy Driscoll administration to see if we can get some of those things front loaded with them uh, and recognizing uh, the important role that they can play as we look at the very unique challenges facing our rural communities, this being only one of them. When you talk about housing, I, I was thrilled that the governor mentioned the, the necessity of addressing the housing crisis across the Commonwealth in her inaugural address. Uh, that was a clear charge to me to make sure that we are uh, again talking with that administration about how State programs are not right-sized to rural communities when it comes to housing. We don't need uh, hundreds of units. You know, we might need 25 in a community and that could really make an enormous impact. Uh, and that's workforce housing. It's looking at senior affordable housing. Uh, but we do need to make sure that the programs that the state is putting in place reflects the needs of rural communities because to date, it's been a real struggle. Um, and, and I just want to recognize the work of so many people who are lifting up this issue of housing, because right now we really do have uh, a real problem here in Franklin County. Uh, talking about climate change, you know, we've just passed uh, two pieces of climate legislation in the last session, uh, which was really incredible. Uh, I was thrilled to work alongside Senator Comerford to, uh, to get the grid modernization bill into place, which will require utility companies to proactively upgrade electricity and transmission in the distribution grid. Um, and yeah. well, maybe we better keep those polls in and yeah. take the polls out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another piece, you know, we, but we also, we also were able to get uh, a bill passed to allow for uh, the expansion of equitable access for solar energy and that metering. This was a single parcel solar bill. Uh, so that piece of legislation will allow for additional solar to be put on rooftops. Um, and then when you're talking about polls, uh, one of the bills that I did introduce uh, when I first came into office uh, as, as a result of the really incredible efforts of my predecessor, Steve Kulik, was an act relative to municipal authority and public rights of way, um, which does specify that if utilities delay in relocating poles and wires, municipalities can have the authority to move poles and wires uh, and can charge utilities for non-performance. Uh, Michelle, Rep. Michelle Socolo will be taking that bill on this session, uh, but I'll be working closely with her. And I will say, if you, if you are having issues with double poles, 
let's have a let's have a conversation about that because I it's easy enough for me to pick up the phone and talk to each one of the utility companies and the DPU. Uh, and we recently had a conversation with a DPU about double poles. If you have poles that have been out there for longer than 90 days, I want to hear about it. Oh, oh so you can talk, <laughs> maybe talk to DPU into assessing those fines. I will talk to the DPU to about get. I will talk to the DPU about getting the utilities out there to make this a priority. Um, they did make that offer to me in our conversation as we were talking about double poles. Um, so if you can get me a list of what where those are or, or the poll numbers themselves. That would be incredibly helpful, and we'll get that over to them and ask them to to get we'll on it by the end of the week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me see. What else do we have? Oh, and on the electrification uh, of vehicle yeah. fleets, um, as part of the climate bill that we did pass, there was um, requirements in there for Jesse and DOER uh, to study the elect electrification of school fleets of RTAs um and rollout plans I, I would need to check to see if they included uh, public safety vehicles in there but i do know that it included those plans for both school buses um and regional transit authorities um so that was that was a big uh, push there uh what else you're gonna get back to me about mptc and the cost of equipment um i heard you on the social consumption the marijuana permits, it might be something that we can help with there. If you want to follow up with our office on that, we can also uh, see if there's anything that we can do on that end. Um, I hear you on open meeting law and it not be, you know, if you have a three person committee, it's really difficult to, to function effectively. Uh, it's something that I've heard before and I'm happy to, to lift up. And on remote public participation, um, I, I think that that is one of the, the best things that came out of COVID in terms of allowing people to participate wherever they're comfortable, or um, if you have child care issues, whatever it happens to be, uh, it is certainly something that we want to make sure that we keep going forward um, in a logical way that makes sense for rural communities too, who might not have the capacity to be able to to do it on as, as large of a scale yeah. as the urban community. We don't have a problem with remote public participation. That's not illegal. But no. after this law expires, yes. it would be illegal for me as chair, yes. or at least illegal yes. is probably too strong a word. I can't participate as chair in a meeting yes. unless I'm in person. Yes, and I did and raise, I flagged this for the committee last session when we were going over this. Yeah. That's the thing that's illegal. It's not illegal for us to open it up to Zoom and have public participation. And that's... Um, and, and I think this is typical. We always we get more people uh, coming if we've got the Zoom option available. And I think that's been really great. I agree with you that that's been really great. But yeah, yeah okay. So you're you're aware of what the actual yes little detail of the law is. Yes. Yes. That, yeah. yeah. And and I've also heard that you know the requirement that really you know some companies shouldn't have to have to be in a Zoom format or a hybrid format. Um, so we're, we're working on lifting that up again this session that we did at last session too. No, okay. I think that was, I think, I think I checked off everything on the list and we have some follow-up for you and you have some follow-up for us. Uh, so we'll make sure to, um, Brian, we'll wait to hear from you. And then if we need to have some back and forth, we'll do that. Yeah, and the, the five million dollar earmark for the garage too. Don't forget yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Five million dollar. I was gonna. We were, uh, okay. We, we five go. million. Uh, I was trying to start high. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. No, I guess you're serious. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had $5 million for every community in the first Franklin. Let me tell you, we, we would do amazing things. Not that we're not already, but. <laughs> yeah, then I, I, I didn't talk that much about the South County Senior Center. You're going to get that from Deerfield and Sunderland, though, when you go to visit those like work meetings. That, uh, that, you know, we, we do need a long-term place for those, and we don't really know how we're going to find that. Uh, support to, to do something like that. We're working on it though. I don't have a good idea how we're going to solve that problem, but uh, if that municipal building fund 
might also include things like community centers. Yeah. That uh, that might that might be a place to start. Yeah, and Senator Comerford and, and Jim McGovern too. You know, we we did host a a, a meeting in Deerfield. This was something that was was raised then. Uh, Senator Comerford uh, and I were able to secure some funding in the budget to look at the South County Senior Center. Uh, yeah. So it's certainly something that's on our radar. Yeah, so that's going on. Well, it's, it's starting soon mm -hmm. uh, to see if there's an old building that could be re uh, repurposed. Um, I, having seen it, don't have high hopes, but I think it's absolutely worth looking into. So, okay. So, okay. Uh, so thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, know? we talked to you for something like almost not quite an hour, but a good chunk of an hour. Does anybody else have anything they want? Thank you. To say You're, welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. It was a good, thank you. Know, a good way to end it. Thank you so much for coming and paying attention uh, to to what we're what we're worried about. No, uh, well, thank you. Uh, it, it's really an honor to work alongside all of you. Um, it, I and you, know, Brian. Uh, Keith, it's really great to have such partners in, in town government. So thank you all for doing what you do every single day. I know it, it takes up a lot of time and uh, I just hope you know how much it's appreciated. And Fran, I did leave you a message. I hope you got it. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Uh, Brian, we'll, we'll talk uh, later on this week. Sounds okay. good. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, all right. I think we we'll get uh, Paul Mark here. That'll be uh, yeah. That'll be good. All right. Um, so that's it for schedule appointments uh, under COVID nineteen. So you don't have any changes to policies or anything. Just a reminder to everyone that we have rapid COVID tests available at the town offices. They're just that you know, just inside the first door there. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to add something to that? Yes, in the library and uh, in the uh, Dr. Becky Jones's office on Tuesdays, and we might put them in the transfer station too. We have that many, so. Oh, excellent. Okay, <laughs> so you won't if you get one, it's probably not going to keep somebody else from getting one if they need it, right? <clears throat> so yeah, so we have plenty of those. So please, mm -hmm. <clears throat> please grab one. Okay. I think we are on to old business then. Um, the, let me see, we've had someone patiently waiting here about the put this digital equity. Oh, but then there's a buy recycle. So it's two people. All right, I'm going to go in the alphabetical order here. Um, so you're like second next. Okay, so up next. Um, <laughs> right, to discuss and vote on amendments to the buy and recycle policy from the Board of Health related to compostable products. So I assume, Fran, you have something to say about that. Yes, um, the Board of Health uh, recently passed along a recommendation to uh, amend the town's uh, recycling purchasing policy, recycle product purchasing policy to include compostable items. I believe you have a copy in front of you or somewhere. Mm -hmm. If you'd like me to go over it, it's pretty, it's a draft. So it's, it's uh, open for discussion, obviously, but it's a, I don't know if you can see it. I could do a share screen or Brian, do you have that? Yeah, I can share. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, basically, we just added in what uh, is now available um, in terms of buying compostable items. We didn't specify exactly which, but obviously for food, um, service wares and things like that there's, there's plenty of product there um mm -hmm. it has to meet compostable standards um and compostability for in in a commercial facility right now all of uh, our waste is going to martin's farm which is a commercial facility can handle meat bones etc heavy heavy duty stuff so can certainly handle compostable products that are certified. And like we did with the post-consumer recycling content, um, there are minimum standards mentioned. There are minimum standards for 
biodegradable compostable products. And there's a Institute BPI um, mm -hmm. biodegradable products Institute that's that certifies those. That's apparently the gold standard um, and things are evolving. So more and more products will become compostable and cheaper. Uh, we use them at the uh, Whaley 250th to some degree and in the fall um, festival. Also to largely we had minimum waste and we want to get to zero waste at least in town events <laughs> if we can get there. So this is a step in that direction and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's a, a word that has a question mark in front of it. Oh yeah. And, uh, and and does that mean that that why why is the word cafeteria in there with a the question mark? Because <laughs> I forgot to take it out. Uh, no, <laughs> honestly, um, uh, it it should be part of the whole town purchase. Obviously, I believe. Although I'm not sure how the uh, schools. <laughs> Schools purchase their products, whether it's a regional basis or something. So that that's part of the reason why the question mark. Oh, okay. I um, see. So, um, so I guess that brings up the question: Does this policy apply to the school uh, when they are using disposable products? That are they using compostable? Yeah, because we take their food waste now. So um, it would be right, good. But, to, but you don't take their non-food waste, do you? Uh, and if it were compostable, if it, if it okay. were compostable, we would. Yes. Right. But if they're using a bunch of plastic cups that are non-compostable, you're never mm -hmm. going to know. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know that it might be that a town uh, policy like this would not apply to the schools because mm -hmm. by law, the school committees are the ones right. who get to decide for the schools. So That's I don't right. think we need the word cafeterias in here. Mm -hmm. um, Right. Like food service wares for town sponsored events mm -hmm. is pretty broad. And if mm -hmm. we had a town sponsored event that happened to be held in the cafeteria at the elementary school, this would mm -hmm. still apply. It might not apply to the school on their in their everyday operations. Right. Uh, although I would hope the school committee would be pressing for that independently. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I sort of feel like that word could just be the what's in the square brackets should just be struck. Does that right. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And any other wording changes there that might cause an issue like that, we're yeah. happy to you know work on. Yeah. It does seem like there's sort of a, a, a way out in case of um, like there's vague words like unreasonable price or reasonable yeah. performance right. standards that yeah. are they're meant to introduce some flexibility. Um mm -hmm. Well, those are again that sort of legacy wording, and it's, uh, I just didn't futz with it. We didn't really talk about it because, you know, oh, there's okay. some balance between uh, cost and um, availability, and you know yeah. how much, how available, and how uh, we don't want to force something that's totally uh, out of price range, for example, even though it might be available and increasingly available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's the, the main thing I was thinking mm -hmm. about. Uh, Keith, you uh, able to hand up. Fran, I just have a you know comment about this that you know I I understand what you're doing and following up like with what we did on the 250th committee, but mm -hmm. maybe I'm missing something. But I don't really see that the town really does many sponsoring events through the year that. Have that are utilizing utilizing plates and cups and things like that. Um, Other than the school, the elementary school, sure, I get it. But the, the rest of like here in the town office, there's there's probably maybe one sleeve of cups every month maybe get used at the water fountain, and that's am I missing something? And the well, the, well, if events but, even, but if they're private events, but. Is that is that I don't know. Is it is historical it society a private event or is it town? I think it's private. Now, it, are you meaning? no? But it says public events held in town. Public events spaces. held in town. 
on yeah. this. Yeah. So, so the fall festival. That's and, uh, going to be so every time somebody does come into the town hall and serves they're food. going to have to be made aware that they can't. Okay. And but they that this is our policy. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be, I think, difficult to enforce. Who's going to sure. enforce? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of this is going to be difficult. This is the first step in awareness building, and uh, you know it's it's not completely flushed out because there's not always a a product easily yeah. compostable and available. But you have to start somewhere. And the other thing that without and Fran, as you know, without the aid of having you and staff to be on site during the two fiftieth. It mm -hmm. doesn't take long, and this this you can get a real mess by having yeah. non-postable stuff put in with it. And if there if you have an event at the town hall, and people are mixing compostable stuff with non-compostable, mm -hmm. who's gonna? Somebody's got to be there to enforce it, or it's not gonna work. Yeah, I think you're right. And initially, we planned to like we did the fall festival. We were they're educating and we had uh, different bins set up and basically we came away from the the fall festival with a mini bag of uh trash now, everything else was either compost food waste utensils um or recyclable so it's just a matter of um getting people used to doing f finding alternatives and yeah. you know we we helped uh uh, Tom's hot dogs find alternatives, and we would be willing to do that again uh, as um, you know the events take place. And I, yeah, it will take some watching out. I, I, I was going to say you're not going to get 100 percent compliance up front. You just want to get people right in the habit of using mm -hmm. one set of product rather than another, and disposing mm -hmm. in a certain way. And over time, yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll get used to it. I think that's the hope. And I think part of the idea also when we started this was that we were going to be uh, that you you and others were going to be resources on this. That's I can't right. remember which of the hats you were wearing at the time. Was, <laughs> the um, department or the uh, solid waste management uh, I, or both. But that 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 was part of the plan was to be a resource. So this isn't a punitive thing. That it's something mm -hmm. where you have help uh, right. comply. Which, yes. Which is, uh, and if which Becky is, were here, she would be, you know, part of that crew. We um, we've discussed it, and it's ongoing because the, Becky and and uh, some of us are also working on a more a broader policy for zero waste, which I don't know will be coming down soon, and I hope. And uh, this is just one step in that direction, and uh, we are obviously going to be there to provide guidance, information, resources, like we did at the Fall Festival. So whether it's my hat as a Board of Health or uh, solid waste um, or just volunteer citizen. Um, and so I think that issue will over time kind of resolve itself for with those, with the private entities holding public events and town owned spaces. Once the board gets out, that's the hope. Okay, Julie, do you have any? No, anything you wanna? Um, I think on the agenda it says to discuss and certainly potentially vote on the amendments. The amendments are in green, and the amendment to the amendments is to strike the word cafeterias in the square brackets. Um, I would move that we accept the amendments as slightly amended by the board. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 We don't have no. to roll. We don't have to roll. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That Thanks. Is, Thank you, everybody. Nice. Thank you. Okay. Now. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, <laughs> next item under all business to discuss a vote toward the contract for the municipal digital equity planning grant work. That's what you're here for. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. And they want um, Hannah to just sort of get And Hannah. Oh, like, there's Hannah. Oh, you're not disintegrating. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you got yourself active. Okay. People. I don't know whether to yeah. hand it to Hannah or to, excuse me, can you remind me your name? Jessica. Apple. Jessica. I'm with the, uh, the regional council. Oh, okay. I'm happy. So I would have Hannah. Let Hannah go first. Yeah. yeah because yeah. Hannah, go ahead and give us some background, please. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the Municipal Digital Equity Initiative Planning Grant is um, a grant that we were recently assorted or awarded through the um, Municipal Broadband Initiative, Massachusetts Broadband Initiative. Um, it's a planning opportunity to increase digital equity in town, meaning that uh, our hope was that it would increase more infrastructural access to digital access in addition to um, the more uh, social factors like um, knowledge about digital access and access to uh, equipment. Um, we're kind of, that's kind of what we're looking to compare right now with various contractors. So Jessica Atwood was kind enough to come from FERCPOC to uh, explain their, uh, I don't want to say scope of work because I don't, I don't think, well, I'll let Jessica speak to uh, what she's presenting, but um, we're going to talk about our plan for the future um, for two potential contractors. Okay. So I have brought with me a kind of draft. This thing? Yes. Right, yeah. Scope of work. I apologize. I didn't mail it to email it to you in advance. And Hannah, you haven't seen it yet. Um, so I will email you a copy of it when I get back to the office tomorrow. And basically I can just I won't go it's I won't go into detail unless you want me to, but I can basically can kind of give you the snapshot of the two options. Um, and as Hannah said, you know, we are one pre-approved consultant that the Massachusetts Broadband Institute has pre-approved. There, I think there's other consultants, whether you choose us, whether you choose another consultant, that's fine. I think the important thing is that Wickley does this work. Um, and so basically you have two choices. You can do a charrette, which basically is that first page and uh, first sheet and what I handed out. And basically it's, it's focused around doing a workshop. It's kind of the short-term version of doing this. If you want to have a workshop and have a report, we would, you know, the consultant looks at the conditions currently in the town. And as Hannah was mentioning, it's the MBI is really focusing on um, access. Is there infrastructure? Is it affordable? Is there enough bandwidth? Then looking at devices, do people have the devices to access the internet? And is there digital literacy? So those are the three things that are really about. Uh, that the MBI is focused on for this for this work. Um, to, if you wanted to do the longer plan, that's the second page, and that's a more robust planning process. Um, we would ask that a committee to be formed that we could work with. Um, they would help us. We would do two community meetings. You do a kickoff community meeting. Um, you might want to do targeted outreach through surveys or through focus groups or interviews. Um, and then you do a follow-up meeting and you actually draft a plan that gets presented to the select board, the select board would approve. So the difference between the charrette and the planning process is, is time and effort. If you wanted to do it quickly, if you wanted to do it as a full plan. Two things that are part of, as part of the charrette, one thing that we're doing as FERCOG, whether we're selected as your vendor or not, is we are doing a survey of what we're calling a, a provider survey. We're going to reach out to regional organizations. Since we will be working likely with multiple towns, um, I, Greenfield Community College, the Franklin County CDC, there's a lot of re community action. There's a lot of regional organizations that um, either provide some sort of digital equity service or their constituents rely on broadband access. So we want to we want to do a survey of what they think the needs are in the region. That way, each town is an interviewing or surveying GCC 26 times. So we're going to do that regardless, and then we're gonna, we're willing to share the findings from that survey to any consultant that the Franklin County towns want to work with. So whether it's us or somebody else. So for the charrette, it includes doing provider survey. For the plan, it includes this provider survey, and it's regional wide organizations, as well as like the senior center. Your senior center is a multi-town thing. So we would include them, even though it might be physically located in Deerfield, it includes Wheatley constituents. We'd also do a second survey, a resident survey um, that would go out to your you know, businesses, your households, and asking what they think their needs and issues are. And that will help form recommendations that would go into the plan. Um, so you have the choice of Charette workshop, 
our full plan, and then you have the choice of FERCA or another vendor. Um, and like I said, we would share any information that we're providing to all vendors anyway. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. And what I put out into this scope of work is more details of what we would expect from the municipality as a partner if we were selected, and if we had a committee that's formed for the planning for part of it to do that. Anna, did I miss anything? Would you like me to go into anything else? That was an awesome explanation. Thank you so much. I'm curious, um, for my own benefit, what the FERCOG would do for infrastructural investigation for the town of Waitley. So um, there is the, both the Massachusetts Broad Institute and the FCC. There is a new push to do to get accurate mapping of broadband services because that has been an issue forever. Um, so there, what we would do is for either the workshop or for the planning process is we would get the maps that we know that the Mass Broadband Institute has. We would have them available for people to actually provide comment on. Well, I live on this road. There's no infrastructure on this road. And they'd be able to tell us that information. And then we can feed that into the MDI. And then eventually, hopefully, it would feed into the FCC's maps. So it isn't like you know we have staff that's going to go out and look at polls. We would be relying on households and businesses bringing that information to this process so that we would be able to identify infrastructure needs. Cool. Yeah. So it'd be very dependent on people attending a workshop. Or, or doing the survey or, yeah. I mean, so it, it seems like the workshop would be the weak link. It could be, yeah. Um, and that a survey would stand a much better chance, although there's also. And one thing you know, to keep in mind, so, We've been pre-selected as a consultant by the MDI. So we've, we, if, we're, if we are selected, we would take this template and then we would work it out to, to meet your needs within what we've already said to the MDI that we can do. Um, so if, you know, if we need a resident survey along with the workshop, that may add a little time if we go that route, but we could talk about that. That could be an option as opposed, you know, the resident, survey is already part of the planning process to choose the plan. Um, the other thing that's, uh, we probably talked about this before, Hannah, um, we are paid directly by the MBI, so you don't have to worry about, you know, you're not gonna get the money and then have to pay us and do any kind of procurement that's already been done. So once we negotiate what our scope of work is, I submit it to the MBI and then they approve us as the vendor and then we would proceed. Similar process if you chose a different consultant. And one thing also I wanted to toss out there is uh, I believe our office may be involved with helping with the master plan visioning process. Um, we are, yeah, we are likely idea. going to be working with another town that's doing a master planning process. And we're actually doing the digital, e digital equity planning process. We're incorporating it into their master, master planning process. So we're doing it all at the same time. So that resident survey is going to be part of what they're already doing as opposed to a separate survey. So I'll leave that up to you and to who you're working with in our office. If you see that there's a way to incorporate those two things, we can get to doing that as well. And the MBI knows that and they're fine with us doing that kind of thing. I have a question about other contractors who we might consider. Are there other contractors on the table? Yes. Can't answer that. Yep. Um, so we have one other contractor who's on the table. Um, they're the Massachusetts, uh, let me pull up the official name really quickly, but um, they have provided uh, another scope of work that I sent out recently to the select board. Um, that scope of work, I think, uh, well, we can go over the details of that scope of work as well. Um, but uh, to me, well, it sounds like it wouldn't dovetail as well with um, the current work that we're doing with the planning, um, the master plan. Uh, that's my initial reaction. But um, if, yes. If you get too much farther, you know, I, I, if you want to have a frank discussion about us compared to the other I certainly can leave. So, um, if you have any other questions for me or anything that you'd like to hear from me, I can give that to you now. And if you'd like me to leave, I will not take offense if you want to have a discussion about the other vendors. I don't need you to leave, but I'd be interested to hear what Hannah prefers. I I think uh, the decision is up to the select board. So um, how soon do we have to decide this? Because I, I sort of feel like 
Um, this I certainly didn't see till today. This came in my in basket on a very busy day. And so I, I didn't get a chance to, to read it over. And I didn't read the submission from the other consultant uh, prior to this meeting. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So like, how, how urgent is it to vote on this? So we do need to get back to Massachusetts Broadband Institute with our choice for consultant by tomorrow. Um, oh, so I. <laughs> no, okay, so it's not urgent. Okay. <laughs> and, and Hannah, was that from Josh that it, it had to be a response by tomorrow? Yeah. Yes. I think you can push on that if you wanted to. Okay. <laughs> but that's, well, but yeah, there's, there's yeah. Try to text Josh right now, maybe <laughs> if you want me to. Okay. Um. Yeah. I my understand. He told us that uh, he needed an answer by tomorrow. I, I'm not sure how flexible it is, but if you'd be willing to reach out, that would be awesome. Is it possible to bring up the other submission and scoot through it quickly? If yeah. it's as, if it is as the same yeah, this, yeah, as this one? Yeah, it's not in here. It looks pretty like this. I have it and can share my screen. I have the pertinent yeah. information highlighted. If it's succinct, we might be able to get through it and make a determination tonight. Um, I, yeah, I don't have the FERCOG one in front of me. It's a few pages long, um, we, but I can. Yeah, we have the FERCOG. Yeah. Oh, you got to figure it out. I think it's open up for that. But I have no, I printed it out. Oh. Uh, there we go. I just need to send it to 28. Today. Okay. So cover letter, cover letter, cover letter. There's this go for Cost and timeline there. Planning experience, Cambridge, Boston, State of California, mm -hmm. Rhode Island, Commerce. Yeah, so um, the things that I think are pertinent to this discussion, at least that I have highlighted on mine, um, are especially in task three, the analysis of existing broadband access and affordability conditions, including availability, pricing, and ACP usage and gaps. Yeah. Um, that is on page four of the scope of work. Um, I think that's important because that'll be what they'll, that's where they'll be getting their data most. That's what we, they'll be looking into. And I think that's where we can truly figure out um, how well focused on Waitley and Waitley's needs this scope of work is. Um, it looks like that. Say again, you said task three, but I don't yes. see that on page four. Let's see. Um, Page, yeah, page four of the PDF. So if you go up a couple, page, oh, a couple oh, okay. pages, so be, not the numbered page. Not the numbered page. Okay. Sorry. So, all yeah, right, test three analysis of existing broadband access. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like they'll be getting most of their data from the Affordable Connect or about the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, that's a national program. Um, they'll also be getting most of their data publicly, demographic, economic, population data, um, things from well, the American. Getting, uh, if they really do what they say they're going to do here, they're not going to get good data. That's what I'm saying. Good. Yeah. So I think that. He's 01093 zip code for one. Which, yeah, I was going to say, which, it looks like boilerplate that they plugged in. But they, that they're just you know skimming stuff off of websites that don't have accurate information about us. Yeah, I agree. And it sounds like for COG, um, we'll have a more in-depth analysis of the data. Um, so and we take that for what it's worth. Yeah, certainly a pre-existing relationship with FERCOG with many other yeah. projects over the years. Maybe we select them and then hammer out the scope of work. Yeah, yeah. online sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't want to hammer out the scope sense. of work, you know, which program anyway without knowing what kind of volunteer base we will have to serve uh, yeah. that, that they want. In the case well, who of are the stakeholders for digital equity? I would think schools. Yeah, the school. The, school. the first one happen. I thought of was that the, yeah. the schools would have some place yeah. in that because they know the people who really need it from among certainly uh, families with young children. And um, I would say the senior center. Senior center the seniors, yeah. We get calls all the time and mainly are default. IT community yeah. IT person with yeah with yeah. basic yeah. questions about, no, about no the answers. Answers. <laughs> so honestly from serving on the 
uh, cable advisory committee, I happen to know most of our town is wired. The amount that's not wired or you know with uh, with fiber is pretty small. It will not be that difficult to identify. They won't be able to identify it using 0193 though. <laughs> okay. Well, they do a great job. But <laughs> right, um, there I I, 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 I have an old I have an old map where I put drew in in pen the extensions that Comcast made under the most recent um, contracts. Because that's right. usually when the extension comes, uh, or when there's new construction, uh, and they'll often, if someone's willing to sign up for broadband, they'll they'll give them a deal on getting it up the driveway and so on. So there. There are, I'm not saying that there's no place in town that's not covered. There are people for whom the driveway is pretty freaking long and they can't afford that part. We made so some extra poles. We, we, we've got some extra poles though, so yeah. maybe we can make a deal. If so I, oh, so then I sort of feel like I know what the general result is going to be on that. And what I was excited to hear about was more about digital literacy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, Helping with that, I guess the other stakeholder might be the libraries, because the libraries are uh, providing internet access at the, while they're open to people who are there. Um, they may be not as big a stakeholder as the schools and the senior center, but maybe they're a stakeholder who could be involved in that. So we might have a significant group who, I mean, so it might be that, I mean, the Charmette seems like mini. That's what I'm. And the one where we actually maybe try to enlist a little bit more participation from stakeholders might be appropriate. We don't have to make that decision tonight, though. Right. I'm contacting the program manager at the NBI to see if you have to make any decision tonight. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And if we do have to make a decision, do we have to make a decision between option one and option two, or can we just say, yep, we're going to work with you? That's a Hannah question. Um, Hannah, I'm quite sure. Yeah. So we yeah. applied not for the charrette, but for the full planning program. Oh, um, well, well, then. Then we're yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who wants the poop and bladder when you can buy, you know, a full one? Yeah. Another reason for making this decision tonight is Hannah is leading to our resource for yes. knowledge yeah. in house. Yes. Yeah. Goes away. Yeah. yeah. And Hannah, um, have you talked at all about the Digital Equity Partners Program, the other program happening at the MBI? No, we haven't talked about that. One of the things with the recommendations that you'll be coming up with, um, the goal is to take those recommendations and funnel it to what is called to MBI pre-selected partners. They have six areas that these partners have been um, charged with helping implement. So if there's a digital literacy element, um, it would be, you know, we would advocate to that partner to see what kind of resources could be brought to Waitley and to Franklin County to do those types of programs. So as it's it's kind of a weird thing, the MBI has all this money from the feds and they have such a short time frame. Usually you would say, let's do all this planning and figure out what our recommendations are, to implement, and then let's implement. They're doing it at the same time. Uh -huh. So um, they're there will be, and there's also future funding expected from the feds, um, whether it's infrastructure or more of these digital equity elements. I know definitely for infrastructure, I'm not sure about digital equity, but we know that there's more broadband money coming in. So a lot of this is getting prepared to know what you will want to go for, either yeah. through the partners that have money or through these future funding programs. Yeah. They want people hooked up. Yeah. <laughs> Or know what to do when to get hooked up. Yeah, and then know what to do when you are hooked up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll be comfortable moving forward on actually voting on this. On, on, we can have on a which consultant? Yeah. Um, yeah, because it says, just says to vote to award the contract for municipal fiscal equity. Doesn't say to whom on there. So okay. the motion should be paid. To whom? I would move to vote the award for the contract to the Franklin Regional Council of Government. Second. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. 
Well, business part B, and it's 7.30. Well, thank you very much. And Hannah, we can talk, um, and then I'll be back to work on the actual scope of work um, with you. And, Okay. Yeah. Um, so okay. We're going to take a one minute break. Okay. There might be a minute and a half. Okay. Well, we got a timer going. Okay. So. <laughs> And one other thing I'd like to mention is, uh, as Natalie mentioned about the schoolhouse um, building, yeah. if as you're working. Yeah. Okay. We're back from our short break. Uh, great. Then let's go on to the next item, which is cylinder old business. To discuss and vote on an agreement with Kirkcock to begin work on phase one of the master plan update. Is that yes. another hand? Yes. Okay. Um, so we've received $25,000 from the Community Compact Grant Program to complete the first phase of our master planning process. Um, mm -hmm. Kirkcock has agreed to prepare a scope of work for us. Um, seems like a relatively thorough first phase uh, scope of work um, and they're willing to begin it. So initially they were talking about uh, starting it relatively soon, but with the staff transition at Waitley, they were hoping to begin it um, at the beginning of the new fiscal year following June 30th, probably July 1st. Um, oh, okay. So waiting until the, the new Hannah is in place and has their feet on the ground. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so if I'm happy to answer any questions, um, this no. is just phase one. It's not the entire master planning process. Um, just keep that in mind. Um, and we have approximately, we have two years from the contract signing date to complete it. Um, FERCOG anticipates finishing this work by March of 2024. We have until November, 2024 to finish it. So we'll be well within timeline, even if we do end up pushing it to the new fiscal year. Okay. Well, there's not like another group that's begging to do phase one work on a master plan. Of course. No, it's just for Congress uh, time. Yeah, we're satisfied with the scope of work that they presented. Um, I don't, when I can read it, I'm not, I, mean, I can't tell if it's a good scope of work for phase one on the master plan, um, but I assume it's something, they've done that before. We've done that before. I think even for us, those really didn't use it. Yeah. It's a path I, well I don't, yeah, it's a it's a path well tried, I guess. That's a good way of putting it. Um, does anybody have any other it's fine. Um, questions or comments? Yeah, it's skimming it. It's, it's quite thorough. Okay. Move All right. We accept Burkhab to work on phase one of our master plan update. I'll second that. Okay. All of those in favor. I Hi. Hi. Okay, great. Preliminary inspection on pizza building study for a new highway garage. I feel like that's a thread item. Or is that a a, a Keith item? Any one of us. Any one of us. I'll get the whole committee here. Uh, all right, well, you want me to I'll move it to the right. Okay, okay. To whoever you think. Uh, I'll to. start. Um, when you do highway garage, we. There are any number of questions which have to be answered as preliminary questions, such as what the building is going to be, where it's going to be, and some very, very rough estimate of what we can afford or what we have to spend to get what we need. Yeah. Uh, and this is really just the, the first step in that process. Um, this. I contemplate and uh, bring at some point along the line, probably not at its initial stage, also bringing Fran and Board of Health in or uh, South Place because this will inevitably impact the transfer station. So we may be talking about highway garage and a new transfer station yeah. location facility, something. Mm -hmm. But yeah. given that the buildings are you know, they're physically connected, that will will be a part of it somewhere. And one thought is that one or the other, either highway department or transportation, theoretically could be located on the DeMeo property, which the town owns. We need a 
a survey, not just a basic survey, a survey, but a survey which tells us how much of that lot is buildable, what's in wetlands, what's in flood zones, yeah. how much of a footprint we can have for a building on that property, and would that be suitable? And that again is part of a, would be part of this feasibility study to figure out where we could put these various jigsaw puzzle pieces we need to move around. So that that's what we're talking about now is first step in just very basically scoping and looking into the issues involved in this large project that yeah, we will be able to yeah, that would be able yeah. to take. But we need because then Ben Keith will tell us the current highway building is simply inadequate. Yeah, 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 yeah. there were OSHA issues. There, there are the many issues. issues. Yeah. I mean that that is at least one really compelling one that means we we have to do something about it. We can't just put up with something that's uh, right. Well, so another issue that's unsafe. when unsafe when yeah. we're looking at new equipment last right. year, Keith told you there are certain things we can't consider because. They're too tall. The door, they're too tall for the building. Right. right. And we shouldn't be settling for it. Yeah. The equipment that's not suitable for our needs because we can't fit the suitable right. equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the two that come up yeah. the most. Um, so what's the plan, insofar as there is one, to to look at all those options and to assess them? Is that something where we need to put uh, some money for paying surveyors or consultants into the upcoming budget so that we can get the information we need. Um, I think well, we have a lot of information about the the, the reasons why we need we, to replace that. We've, or, we've, we've actually been putting money towards a building stabilization fund and this money could it could be used for could that. be used for that and that would take a some sort of town meeting yeah code, but it can be a special town meeting. Or right. annual town meeting. But it's, I mean, it sounds like you're at the point where you may need uh, money to be able to get the information that you need. Is that we need to hire someone to do hire someone to do so or something? Um, actually, if I could jump in, uh, the complete neighborhoods grant that we received in partnership with other towns in the region um, is willing to fund a wetlands delineation for the DeMaio property and the phase one environmental assessment. This is in the hope of exploring potential housing, affordable housing for that, but it's in no way promising that we'll develop housing on that property. It's just an exploratory venture. So what were the two things that they could do? A wetlands delineation and a phase one environmental assessment. And they would also prepare a preliminary concept plan for housing based on zoning and constraints, but there's no agreement that housing will be yeah, produced yeah, there. Oh, okay. That's a grant we already have. Yes. And that's the ball is already rolling. Um, and Brian and Christine Medor, the coordinator from that grant program, will be meeting after I leave. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. That's the start. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry. This is like this is what that was like the 151st grant you got for us or something. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Grant Davis. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's good because those sound like they're relatively they, those could be expensive environmental related surveys and plans. But can that because you really have to hire a specialist for that? Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, it, I just think to answer the question, yes, I think it's going to cost, it, it is going to cost money. Um, really, I think the first step is a feasibility study um, that'll identify, you know, what the highway department needs. Yeah. Um, and um, that'll look at locations and, you know, we may have to identify several locations. Maybe it's the existing, you know, the existing. Yeah. Uh, Parcel that's there that the highway cross now maybe it's the mile maybe it's another place um, but it'll start sort of pricing out and sort of designing out sketching yeah. out sort of what what we're going to need that will give us a you know give us a rough cost estimate um, and then at some point assuming it's over one point five million dollars we would have to hire an OPM the owner's project manager the procurement law requires any projects over one point five million. Unless Natalie gets law change. Right. Unless Natalie gets a law change for us. Um, for us to we have to go through a qualifications-based process. 
to hire an OPM, which means that it's a separate solicitation for the submission is separate, right? We list qualifications and then in the sealed envelope here, there's price, right? And then, you know, we select based on qualifications, the committee, and then we negotiate price. Um, once we get an OPM, so the OPM is essentially an architect or engineer yeah. um, who works for us to supervise the architect and engineer that we're going to hire that's also going to work for us. Um, we'll figure that one out. Right. Um, but again, it's a second qualifications based process. Yeah, yeah, it's a long process. But, but at this point, that's down the road. That's down the but, road. Yeah. This, but, this, but, this is the first, first step. step. Yeah. First step. Yeah. And the first step yeah. in a year's long process is really right. the feasibility. And study. the feasibility study would consider more than just a new highway garage. Um, I would, I, I, I don't think this is reasonable to just uh, refurbish the existing new this probably. There's probably lots of reasons, and financial will be the bottom line why that's not a good option. But you know, I've heard, I've heard people say, "Oh, well, you could just build on a, like a bigger garage on one side and still use the old garage for certain things." Yeah. And so, the, so it would explore all of those ideas. It wouldn't just uh, say, "Well, you need a new highway garage and only just look at new highway right. garage." It would look at all kinds of uh, ways of reutilizing what is there, whether that's for, um, you know, some reduced, um, I, I want to say reduced usage, that's not what I mean, but sh shifting out things that we're, that we're using that place for now, shifting out some of it, but maybe not all of it, maybe it's appropriate for some things like storage. Yeah. Um, it's, but if I remember right, the OSHA related stuff was um, related to workspaces where people were, not so much places where things are being stored. Uh, or was, if it was places that things are being stored, it was the problem was the way people had to access it was yeah, unsafe. It was it, it, so that so that it's not like the the whole building should probably have a torch put to it. Um, but a feasibility study would that touch on um, like how do you reuse that existing building to whatever extent we can. I, I assume uh, that we can give instruction to yeah. Yeah. Or work yeah. with whoever's doing the feasibility study yeah. to look at these various questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, that would be important to me to, to not have that, oh, here's another building that we have yeah. that we're not using that we got to see if somebody will rent it for a dollar. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I, I think the key is we, we don't go in with any assumptions yeah. of Right. Where it's going to be, you know, what the end product is going to be. We go and say, we need this. Where yeah. should where should we put it, and what should we do with the other property that we're not using? Yeah, for this? that we would not. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I've reached out to surrounding communities to see who has um, went through this process before. I, we have a list of probably seven or eight different firms, and, I, mm -hmm. and the first thing I think that we would we would ask is that they just come and meet with us at the site mm -hmm. of the current highway garage. Just have a discussion and get a yeah. cost estimate for the feasibility study so that we can go to annual town meeting with that, yeah. you know, with that request. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And if we can have it, we can, you know, keep moving ahead. You know, <laughs> leave us your files on that. <laughs> um, yeah, the wetlands delineation. Yeah, you know, um, to get that wetlands delineation moving and ultimately done, that'll help us, you know, give us more information on what we need to know. Sounds okay. great. Hey, Keith, you have anything yeah, to add to that? Everybody pretty much hit on all the topics. I mean, the building was built in 1960. One of the biggest problems was just like in many times when towns do things, they try to do it as cost effective as possible. And the biggest problem we have with that building is that it was built with cinder blocks right from the footings up so that these hollow blocks at ground level were years and years of being exposed to chemicals like salt have turned the cinder blocks into mush. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the building continues to sink into the ground. That's why it continues to crack. Mm -hmm. That's why it continues to break out the windows that are there to the point where we had to block, you know, we had to go around and block all the windows up because the glass units were cracking and breaking as the building shrinks and uh -huh. settles into yeah. the ground. So 
Yeah. When we, when this topic came about many, many years ago to the point of, can we just simply raise the roof? Right, and we had, that discussion. We had contractors had their screen to look at it and say, no, yeah. can't be done. Yeah. The building is, it's. I could imagine someone saying, it can be done, but the building's still sinking. Right. You're not solving this, so the, the they, basic problem but, by but raising building, it. See, the other problem is the building codes, the way that building was built, don't allow it. it and I don't know enough about the building code, but there were certain aspects to that building where building codes would prohibit just raising it up two feet because it doesn't have. Um, I don't think had well, the, the walls couldn't well, carry you. So the wind shear blown against yeah, cinder blocks, it can actually tip it over. Uh -huh. And I don't, there's no structural. Again, that building does not have an ounce of insulation in the cinder blocks. Yeah. It is an icicle in the wintertime. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, no, the no. heating aspect is just horrendous. Um, I don't think there's any debate. Yeah, that we, right. I don't think you think Yeah, you know, I do yeah. think that. Like non temperature looking at the transfer station at the same time is a great idea. Yeah. Um, many a times, one of the things that the DEP complains about or writes us up about is the fact that the transfer station can't be can't be secured. Yeah, um, people come in and can access it from at any any time of the day, all the times of the day, dump things illegally. And we can't stop it. We can't put up a gate out at the street to, to right. prohibit people from coming in there. Um, so it was put in there at the time they closed the dump. Again, cheapest, simplest way to do it rather than creating a new, yeah. new location, which would have cost them more to versus just piggybacking off of some of the utilities that were already there. So yeah, yeah, I know. It, I think it's time to start doing yeah. this. And so as yeah, as much as we can afford it to do we it need right. To, yeah. Like Brian said, let's get some yeah. these contractors that do this on a regular basis, come talk to us and let's yeah. get some okay. numbers for a town meeting. Okay. So that's first step. So let's that goal will be to get the feasibility, money for a feasibility study in the budget for this year. Yeah. And so, and you and Brian and Keith are working on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else I may want to add to that before we go to the next item? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Fran. Fran. Go yeah. Ahead. Um, just um, since I'm just hearing about this, I, I think it's uh, also important to note that um, for siting purposes, DEP provides the permit for the transfer station to function. So they're going to want to know where. This might end up, and you know, because there are oh, yeah. the guidelines for that. So part of this feasibility should look into um, whether DP would allow the transfer station to be sited on or near wetlands. So I'm not yeah. saying no, that they won't, all, but that's all part of the process. Right, right, right. Why it's good to bring in, bring mm -hmm. you into this because you know who has to be. Right, consulted right. or what approvals need to be obtained right. from that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that building is not ideal, <laughs> nor is it the way the transfer station is connected for the reasons Keith and others have brought up. Um, so yeah, it would be good, but there will be a DEP approval necessary for the- oh, there, there are all kinds of approvals that be necessary. This right. Mm -hmm. Step yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Okay. There's another last item under old business. And I have to admit, I don't remember when this was new business. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. shame on me. Uh, to discuss a request for additional CLFRF monies related to the purchase of a new tractor for the highway department. Is it the case that we've Already committed some monies for the tractor, and this is additional yeah, monies. Yeah, it's forty-two thousand. So the, yeah, and town meeting approved, the, approved that. Okay, so that's why this is under old business. The additional money, though, is the kind of the new thing. Yeah. Okay, I would I would still argue that's 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 still business. 
money he would have approved. Right. There was no there was, there was the in a it was a an approval by the select board to spend forty thousand dollars for the tractor. Not a and it costs forty nine. Oh, forty four something. Here? I don't yeah. yeah. It, 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 42 was approved and that was 44, or like 94184. So the request is for an additional approval of $2,941.84 for additional CLFRF monies, of which we have probably around 350000 remaining. I think those three, but yeah, it's close to there. Well, if it's in that 42000 is it not worth it at forty? Five thousand and down. Yeah, if this original amount had been requested, it would have been approved at that time. Yeah. 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 In any case, I don't think that was very controversial. Is this a voting item? Or I yeah. think that this. Uh, I'll right. just said discuss, but I think we we have a we can vote. Yeah. I, I, I move. We are the power. I move that we commit two thousand nine hundred forty one dollars and eighty four cents of CLFRF money to complete the purchase of the. Tractor for the highway department. I second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That was tricky. All right. Yes. Okay. New business. Oh, we've got seven minutes for new business to discuss and vote to reappoint Rick Adamchek as animal control officer. I don't think there's any discussion even needed for that. Move we reappoint Rick Adamchek as animal control officer. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Congratulations, Rick. Thank you for being willing to step up and be our animal control officer. Um, to accept the resignation of Amy Schrader as the assistant town or treasurer collector position. Again, we don't accept the resignation. She's got to stay, right? Right. And this would be effective um, February 28th when, when, when. Win -win. Win -win. Okay. And is this a voting item? Uh, do we have to vote to accept a resignation? I don't, I don't think, think really. So. Okay. All right. Uh, reluctantly accepted. To, uh, we yeah. can't even fire her for other position. She's selected. That's so. right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we would. Not that, yeah. But. Okay. To appoint uh, Montserrat Archifal to the Cultural Council. Again, no greater from as far as I'm concerned. Sounds good. Monty would be a great person for that. Um, uh, and to entertain a motion then. Move. Uh, move. Go I move to appoint Montserrat Archibald to the Cultural Council. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Uh, to set the mileage reimbursement rate for calendar year 2023, they take it the IRS has changed their reimbursement rate. Can we normally go with that? Yes, it's 65 and a half cents. Per mile. And if we accept the IRS's mileage rate of 65 cents, 65 and a half cents per mile. I second that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. We're going to get out by eight, maybe. Burning um, through. To, to, how wordy <laughs> to discuss and vote on whether to delay the annual town meeting until May 2023. So I'm going to pull out my calendar for this. Just normally we have it on the last Tuesday of April or the fourth Tuesday of April. Is that last Tuesday? The right. last Tuesday um, of April, which this year would be uh, April 24th. Uh, the past couple of years, because of COVID, we've had, uh, we delayed the town meeting. It gave uh, boards and committees more time to figure out the budget. Uh, and it also let us have the meeting outdoors. Um, last year it was May, the previous year it was June. Um, I feel like committees were less stressed about getting budgets done with a little bit of extra time. But if I understand correctly, the downside of this is yeah. if we require a debt override or a tax cap override, uh -huh. that in, in any given year, that we it will run. It will run past the end. It'll, it'll run past. No, not not past the fiscal year, but past when our town elections oh, are. So you so have, have separate. So we have had two separate elections. Yeah. Oh, okay. Does right. if that? I mean, if we do this on a year by year basis, if it looks 
you know, going into this year, like that will not be an issue, then we can do it later. It's safer, yeah. And then in any then in some year where it looks like there's that, you know, yeah. serious possibility that we would need that collection, yeah. then we can have the um, earlier we, meeting. Uh, our levy well, I was looking at it earlier. Um, excess levy capacity is 1.17 million for, um, that was for 20, um, that was for 23. Okay. And that's the only, that's the latest that we know about. Really? Yeah. And we're not, we don't figure to be anywhere close to that. Uh, not that I know of. that would be a significant or that would be like that would be the highway garage funding it this year. Right. Funding right. it this year all one year, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, I would move to uh delay the annual town meeting for this coming year until May 2020. Uh, I would second that and say we Make this decision every year about this time. Revisit yeah. around this time. You know, when the administrator starts looking at the budget and if there are storm yeah. clouds on the horizon, yeah. then we can say we can't still push it later. Yeah. Uh, what, I mean, what do you, from your end, Brian, does, does what I say accurately reflect what you see that it was a bit less uh, stressful and it put together a better budget if we had having those extra couple weeks? Yeah, I think it, I think it, yeah, it gives some more meeting time for the personnel committee and the, the capital and planning committee and really the finance committee to, yeah. um, to have discussions. Um, like you mentioned earlier, edu education is the, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the biggest part of our budget and that has historically been compressed to a very narrow yeah. sometimes but, days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The schools yeah. sometimes. Yeah, probably that's essentially no time right. to yeah. consider. Yeah. Okay. Well, it sounded like a function. It, it was. It was. Okay. And uh, seconded. Okay, and seconded. Okay, great. And then uh, all of those in favor? Aye. 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 So I'll work with the moderator and town clerk to find a date. Find I was date. thinking most likely the 23rd is probably. Oh, that would be easy because it's 2023 and it's May 23rd. I, I don't think. 2022 Tuesday after Memorial Day would be great. Right. I'm, just, I'm just saying, I'm going to be able to remember town meeting date. Okay, uh, select board liaison updates. Um, I have one. We had a South County Team Center board oversight meeting just uh, last Thursday. Um, the South County Senior Center is, uh, we kind of basically approved the budget that the director had approved. The main thing that uh, is in there is that we want to increase her assistant to from uh, I think 20 hours to 35 hours, bring this person up to close to full time there. Um, they are doing a lot, um, so much more than we've done in the past. Uh, membership is up. She's going to have a lot of good numbers to support why they need the extra assistance. Um, and uh, the assistant is certified in, in all the kinds of things they need, like driving that uh, handicap accessible van and all of these other things. Um, and yeah, we can have the director driving people around, or we can have her assistant driving them around. Um, and the director's been really good about getting grants and about getting more activities and keeping people engaged. They, it's, just, it's just working so well, and I want to really support that. So I guess what I would just give you a heads up on is that when we see that budget, that uh, there really is a lot of value for the extra money that they're going to be asking for. It sounds good. The one thing that I know we've always, yeah. the finance committee and we've always looked for is yeah. more actual data coming out of the senior center. And, and that what you hopefully will be satisfied with. They will, there will be data. And but much more than there hasn't been in the past. Right, right. I think last year was the first time we got even a little trickle of data. <laughs> Uh, and I think she's she's been really good about keeping track of uh, membership and usage and and so on. So that's uh, the that's the main thing from the board of oversight was that we did come up with a budget to turn into the towns. I think the extra the increase would be something like two thousand five hundred for Whaley, um, ten thousand overall. But the other but that's three towns contributing. So mm -hmm. that's uh, sounds well worth. That's it. something that I think is worthwhile and and I certainly support it. So that's, I think, what 
I, 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 there's nothing else that's probably crushing and critical to get to. Here. So I'll turn it over to Brian for. Well, he. Oh, oh wait. Unless there's an. And I just have you. I have these are chapter ninety project oh, to get yeah, reimbursed from the state. Maybe sure. We want, yeah, I, I can sign him after the meeting or now. Or just sign him, and while you're Brian's doing his thing. Sure. It's all that's five okay, five pages. Back. In the, oh, I'm sorry. Are there any of any? No. No. Okay. There's five pages on the lower okay. right. Is this all of us or just? Is this all three? Yes. Okay. Um, reminder: We're still hiring for <clears throat> hiring for treasurer collector and community development coordinator assistant town administrator. Both those positions are open. We're still accepting resumes. Um, I sent out information that we need to put together a screening committee for the treasurer collector for the town bylaws. Hopefully, we will uh, pull that together soon, and we'll start uh, reviewing resumes. Um, Haneville Road reconstruction project um, that's still moving forward. Keith and I had a conversation with um, some folks from Northampton about uh, trying to figure out uh, Article 97 issues in land and mitigation. Um, so we're still working on that. Um, Egypt Road, I'm going to skip over the grant. Uh, the gap three grant um, item, and I'll let Hannah do that as her parting shot, her parting gift to Waitley. Um, uh, Egypt Road Water Loop Engineering, uh, the water pressures I believe met uh, this morning, and I, uh, they were going to select the Berkshire Design Group as the engineer for that. Okay. Um, so they're going to enter into an agreement for that, and that will start. That was the uh, um, community compact, uh, not community compact. Uh, one stop money, right, Hannah? Um, a one stop grant that again that Hannah had gotten. Um, we're gonna be poor once Hannah leaves. Yeah. Um, town offices solar right RFP um, that was sent out for comment um, to a couple uh, uh, I guess people that would want to take a look at it. UMass uh, Clean Energy <laughs> Extension. Yeah, I always call it Center. Well, mm. C E. Um, it's getting weird again. Yeah. Um, so we have comments back on that, and hopefully we can get that out in the mm -hmm. month or two. Um, center school RFP for long term lease. Again, that we're asking for for uh, for proposals for that to January thirtieth. Mm -hmm. um, I've only given out one. Only one person has requested it, so I'm not mm. optimistic that I'm okay. not going to get much. But I'll send it to Jessica and see what. Yeah, same uh, what happens from that there. Um, FY24 budget meeting schedule. I I emailed it out to the board and I has included it in the packet here. Um, it has the list of joint meetings with the finance yeah. committee and when the finance committee is meeting. Right. Um, commissioners were also going to talk, the water commissioners were also going to talk about water meters at town buildings today. Um, and uh, I think that's something that we'll have more information about at the next meeting. Okay. Um, and then town office the storage space. Um, that's also a discussion that I think uh, needs to be ongoing as to what we want to do with that. Um, you know, I think the historical society had some some interest in some space there. Um, I think we should also have uh, conversations with department heads to see what our internal storage needs are as well. Yeah. Um, throughout you know throughout yeah. the town. Um, so. Okay. Um, and Hannah, about the gap three. Grant. Yep. Yeah. So we've received sixty-seven thousand five hundred sixty-seven dollars to install solar panels on top of the pump house, as well as uh, recommended lighting upgrades. Um, we're still waiting for contract documents. We're at the very beginning of the process, um, and I think that Wayne Hakoski will be in charge of most of the actual administration of the grant. Um, but yeah, we've. Okay. Uh, that doesn't, have, that doesn't have storage. It's just uh, solar panels there, right? It's just the solar panels and the lighting upgrades. Yeah. Are, but they were real. They're a real big electricity source. Huge, uh, yeah. And it would have. Yeah. Yep. It would have been difficult to have battery storage there because of the weather requirements for it. So we just went for the rooftop solar panels. That makes sense. Okay. Well. All right, do we need to sing a song to say farewell to Hannah? When is her actual last day? It's not until Friday, right? Uh, Thursday. 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 Thursday, okay. All right, let's see if we can think of something embarrassing to do on Thursday. Are you going to, is your, is your last day going to be remote? 
Sorry? In person. Will your last day be remote or in person? In person. Okay. All right. Okay. That's why she throws all our files in my cup. Thank you. <laughs> that was really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, right. I think we need a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Uh, those in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>